Are we recording? We are recording. And hello and welcome. Good, good day to everyone. Thanksgiving is coming up. It's in a week's time. But for many of us in LGBT people of color communities, we are alone. Um, we are alone, some of us by choice, like me. We are alone, many others, because our families don't accept us for who we are. We are alone because we have no family or because we are far away from our families or because of some misunderstanding, some argument, some disagreement, we are estranged from our families. And with the COVID pandemic, many of us are likely to be more alone because normally we will get together with other friends and family and go and eat a piece of turkey and eat some stuffing and celebrate the holiday, but not so much about food because food becomes the bond that brings us together it is the camaraderie, it is the coming together, it is the community that we feel around the table. But COVID-19 is gonna prevent us from doing that. So together with the James Baird Foundation um, and Colleen Vincent and Debbie Holloway, we are so happy to be able to offer and present this opportunity to you where we can bring everyone together and at this time, feel that sense of belonging, feel that sense of, I am not alone. I belong to a community. And so with that in mind, I'd like to welcome um, one of my dear friends, Elton Naswood, who is a member of the Navajo Nation. to offer an invocation, because I think one of the things that we have forgotten in the 400 or, or 600 years or more that um, we have been in this country is that before the pilgrims arrived, before the white people arrived, the Native Americans celebrated the end of summer, the fall harvest, and their own sense of com community belonging and coming together as they prepared for the winter, as they prepared for the earth to go to sleep. And they cooked and they had feasts and they celebrated and they welcomed everyone. So let us ask the ancestors and Elton is here and he's gonna join us. And we're gonna invite the ancestors to be here with us this uh, today. Elton, welcome. Yes, Antoine, thank you for that uh, introduction and brief explanation of the meaning of this time of year here in the US. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and formally introduce myself. Yat e she'eya elton nazwa in shia. To hain in shna ta bahan bashish chin. Na kaidane e da shi chay tet ne zani e da shi nale. Diya ya dina in shna. What I said is, hello, my name is Elton Noswood. I am of the Near to the Water clan, born for the Edgewater clan. My maternal grandfather's clans of the Mexican people and my paternal grandfather's clans of the Tango people. This is how I identify as Navajo. So I'm very honored to um, be asked to give this blessing to this uh, virtual event today uh, in honor of uh, our relatives and in honor of our um, are individuals who will be sharing their gift of uh, cooking with us so we can nourish our bodies. So I am going to offer this prayer at this time and then just give a little take afterwards on you know the meaning of this holiday we call Thanksgiving to me personally as a Native individual uh, in the United States. So uh, please feel free to um, offer your own blessings in your own way. Uh, to clear our minds and start in a good way. And I also just lit some white sage as well. So, um, you know, for, um, for cleansing as well as for smudging. Hello, creator and holy people. We come to you at this time to ask for special blessings on us and to ask for 
understanding and compassion and love during this time creator. We come together so we may see and hear each other's voice through this virtual call creator as we're not able to meet in person and hold each other and touch each other. We ask for special blessings for all of us during this time of challenge creator when we're dealing with this pandemic and with this virus that we call COVID-19 creator. We ask you to protect us and guide us during this time as well creator to strengthen our hearts and strengthen our spirits as we either quarantine alone or as we are knowing and protecting ourselves and our families from this virus creator. We ask you to come and be with us during this special time of harvest of this time of change of seasons creator and fill our hearts and our spirits and our minds and our, and our stomachs with the love that you have shown for us creator that we as five fingered people on this world may take and understand the need for healing creator. Our mother earth is hurting creator. Uh, us as five fingered people are hurting creator. We just ask for that special blessings that you give to us. We ask for special blessings for those that are hurting right now. Those that are affected or infected with this disease we call COVID-19 creator. We ask you to strengthen and be with those people during this time creator with their families as well creator so they may get through this. We ask for those who have left us during this time creator, be with them and bless them and guide them and let them understand that they are still with us on this, uh, on this earth creator. We also ask for special blessings for those that are dealing with addiction creator, those that are hurting, those that are sick, those that are unsheltered creator. We ask you to be with our relatives during this time. You have, we also ask you to be with our circle here during this time and ask for blessings for those things that make us happy creator those things that keep us in balance, our family, our loved ones, our partners, our children, our pets, those things that keep us happy creator. We just ask you to bless them and keep us in that good space as well. I ask for special blessings for our presenters today, creator, those that were given this special ability to prepare food, which is an honor creator for most of us. We ask you to bless this food as well as we take it and nourish our bodies. We ask for all of this so that beauty and harmony may be restored. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Anton. I just wanted to ask for special blessings. And I, I've been praying myself during this time and reconnecting with my cultural ways, which I think is a gift and a reminder of how we are as Native people during this time to pray for everyone and to, you know, to pray for those that are hurting. Uh, it is important to remember when we're alone that you know, we begin to reach into ourselves and understand the spirituality that we all possess, whether it's a higher being, whether it's creator, whether it's Jesus Christ, there always are those special individuals that keep us in balance, in harmony and understanding. And as Antoine said, this season is very special to many native tribes. Um, before we were colonized, we used to have special gatherings during this time to celebrate the harvest, to prepare for the winter, to hold ceremonies and prayers that are special and keep us in balance in this world creator. Um, so we utilize this time for that special preparedness. Uh, for the Navajo people, we begin our new year in October during this time. So it's very different than what we as Americans view as, you know, a time for um, celebration and gathering. But this is a time for thankfulness, for understandings, for blessings in a good way. So I just want to offer those few words as we reflect on this time together and also encourage everyone to stay safe, to check on loved ones, to call them, to Zoom with them, but reach out and be with them during this time, as well as during the time of um, um, the holidays as well. So with that, I just want to say <laughs> thank you to Antoine and to the um, other presenters and to our special cooks, um, our chefs who are on this um, event call as well. I'm really excited to see what you make. I'm not sure if you're going to be making fry bread, but if you do, I would love to be a taste tester. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Elton. Um, so just briefly, if you can see my screen. So after Elton's uh, invocation, 
we will have uh, some community agreements, a moment of silence, and then we will introduce um, Ho-Chuk Nation Chef El Elena Terry, and followed, which will be followed by our History and Food um, by Chefs Mavis J. Sanders and Cecily Sierra from Food Plus. Um, and then uh, we will have a discussion following that that will be moderated by um, J JBF Community Vice, Vice President for Community Relations, Colleen Vincent. And then we can take questions or so afterwards. Um, so, so just for a brief community agreement, we ask everyone to keep their microphones muted. Please do not take any photos of the screen. Be respectful of everyone who's participating here, even if you disagree. Please use the chat box um, for, for questions. Leave any questions in the chat box and indicate if for a specific speaker or if a general question for everyone. And the moderator will read it out. You're invited to share in the chat box your thoughts about this discussion. What did participating in it mean to you? And following this event, we will share the slides and recordings on our respective websites. Additional questions and comments, please send information. Please send an email to info at dbgm.org. So I'd like us now to take a moment in silence as we remember those many in our communities who have died, either from suicide or from homicide, and those who may have also died from COVID-19, who are not going to be at Thanksgiving, um, in families, there will be an empty space. So let's take a moment in silence just to bring those people's names, bring our family members, our friends to mind and into this virtual space. Thank you very much. So community members, I have the honor to introduce and to welcome Chef Elena Terry. And Chef Elena Terry is the executive chef and founder of Wild Berries, a nonprofit community outreach catering organization. She is also the food and culinary program coordinator for the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. One of our passions is developing mentorship programs that help build stronger communities within the indigenous food sovereignty movement while empowering participants and establishing healthy relationships. As a seat to, as a seat to table chef, Elena advocates for indigenous and organic growers and producers. She utilizes her partnerships with the Intertribal Agricultural Council at the University of Wisconsin, several tribal farms, as well as her own farm to provide and preserve ancestral ingredients in her community. Community members, I'd like us to welcome Chef Elena Terry. Chef Terry. Haini P, Haini Karagiwi, Ho Chunk Rajda, Hahe Mani Wenga Hingaire, Naga Maikade Rajda, Elena Terry. Uh, I'd like to greet you all a good morning, and it's morning, he's still here in Wisconsin. Uh, my name is Elena Terry. I am a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and I am here in Wisconsin. And uh, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction, for the wonderful prayers. I actually, I, I apologize, I was hoping to have my recipe out to you, but I woke up this morning and I was really thinking about the intention of this uh, event. and how I was feeling even with Elton's beautiful prayer. And I changed my recipe and I decided to share something <laughs> that we love. It's kind of a home cooking meal here at our household, but uh, it's a blue corn waffle that we also add wild rice to. And um, we have this wonderful berry, maple, cranberry, blueberry sauce, and it's all flavors here from Wisconsin. Than especially from the woodland tribes. And um, I've, a lot of ancestral tribes have corn, especially a blue corn of some variety. But I remember 
I had done an event at the University of Wisconsin and it was for a Navajo female that was coming up an, uh, an author and she told me that she was a little intimidated to come. She wasn't used to traveling away from her family. And when she walked in and she saw that I had made this blue corn pudding, she said, I exhaled and I knew that I was meant to be where I was meant to be. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that feeling, especially that connectedness that we're all looking for in these times of, you know, kind of forced segregation and, and isolation and uh, how I could share one of the recipes that really means a lot to me that has the flavors of home and that connectedness that, you know, you can exhale and, and belong and really feel the healing that comes from some of these meals that are cooked with intention. And so as I'm kind of mixing some of this stuff together, we'll talk and some, some of what I had been thinking about when it came to this presentation. And the work that I do with wild berries is really based around the idea that, you know, all of us at some point in our lives suffer a disconnect, you know, whether it has to do with your sexuality or with your goals in life or your passions, we all kind of separate at some point. And uh, I, I suffered it too, I felt it and it, it was my religion, it was my community, but most of all it was my food that brought me back and being able to connect on so many different levels through something so universal and to be able to share the good intention of a, a meal and the nourishment that comes from that, the conversation, the, the good feelings and the positivity it does so much more than just nutritionally feed your body. It's the mindfulness and the present and the appreciation, gratitude, all of that combined into a bite. So uh, I think that one of the very important roles that I like to play in my community is uh, you know, a supportive ally, whether it comes to race or sexuality or anything that makes you a beautiful individual, it's important to know that regardless of where you're at, there are people that will support you. And um, although understanding sometimes comes with time, there's always people willing to listen and uh, utilize those resources, your friends, your family, your community, because we all have at some point felt those feelings. It's a human feeling. And um, I think it's really important to make sure that you find your support system, however it may be with whatever it is that you need support because we all need support, right? But however that is, know that you are never alone, that you will always have that connection. And um, for me personally, one of the ways that I can share that connection is through these meals and how I healed and sharing that kind of vessel. So today, uh, our favorite here on Sunday mornings is a blue corn corn waffle and it's kind of just along the same lines as any other waffle but with the blue corn meal and this is from bow and arrow here uh, you want to add a little bit more moisture to it because it is thirsty and there's a secret trigger to this I'm going to go ahead and sift these dry ingredients the flour the blue corn meal uh, baking soda baking powder and just a little bit of salt into a, a bowl but there's a process and it's a scientific process called nixtamalization, which really changes the seed or the corn and, and it transforms in it. And what it does is what it, it wakes it up nutritionally, flavorfully, and adding that one component to your corn transforms it from something that would be uh, nearly inedible or very non-nutritious to something that is loaded with nutrition is delicious. You can change the flavors. You can change the drying process. This blue corn meal comes from uh, this vibrant cob. Could you, could you get me one just so I could show them? I have a corn and so my, my daughter is going to grab it. But to transform what people, some people call decorative corn into something that's nutritious and edible, you have to do this scientific process of nixtamalization. And that for us is adding uh, hardwood ash to it. And I really do have this container of ash in my kitchen all the time. And you can see that it 
I have this little sifter and it's actually, you know, ashes from the fire. And I like to use hickory or, you know, you around here, we use a lot of hardwood and some other tribes use juniper and uh, other forms of a way to nixtamalize uh, the corn. But when you do that, you remove the outer hull, open up these nutrients. And it also makes it just as, it, it wakes everything up. It changes the color all of it. So I add just the tiniest bit of ash to my blue corn anytime that I use it. And uh, interesting, a lot of the tribes across the Americas have different ways of utilizing corn. So this is just one, the dried seed that we make into cornmeal. And, but we as Ho-Chunks actually have a different way of processing the corn. And I like to think of it as a way that our corn is, not just our corn, but all of our ingredients, is a connector through generations. You know, because the thoughts were made to continue growing specific varieties of corn, we have them today. Because these techniques and traditional farming practices were continued and carried on, we have them today. And it really is something that I feel like we all have a blood memory, a connection to our ancestors. And I'm lucky enough to be able to have these wonderful indigenous flavors and foods all around me all the time. Uh, but I know that every culture kind of has those connections and you know the way that they're related to not only your religion or your beliefs or you know your traditional teachings, but it's also a way that your ancestors are still caring for you. And that's the way I like to think of it. So when we cook in our kitchens, especially with wild berries, it's very well known that we have a positive intention behind what we're doing. And that you are only in the kitchen if you have good feelings going on. Uh, otherwise, maybe it's just a day to eat and to get that nourishment instead of you know providing it because you really add a different depth of flavor when you cook with those prayers. And so I have a couple uh, ears of corn here so you can see, and this is a smaller popcorn that I actually give out to, you know, new babies that come into our family so that they have something to start with. But this is the corn that I'm talking about. These are smaller cobs. A lot of people use them for decoration, but it's a beautiful source of protein of uh, nutrition and of substance. And you can transform that into traveling food, into food that will you know, be preserved for many seasons in case there is a, a bad season or you don't have a significant harvest, which happens. Uh, you always have to have enough for one plus. And that plus might be people in your community that, that aren't able to you know, get that on their own. And I think that when it comes to community and sharing meals, we have something, you know, you take care of your elders and I th think across the board, you know, you, you try and care for your elders and your children, the one that needs it the most, but we definitely live by that. And where our meals are, you know, the first ones fed are the elders. And when you have a harvest uh, from hunting or from, you know, cultivation, the first people you take that to are the elders to make sure that they have what they need to continue teaching and trusting that you will be cared for if you care for them. And it's, it's a wonderful way to build community around food and to really have that be, uh, you know, a mindful intention. So here I have some almond milk, a couple eggs, and just a tiny little bit of vanilla that I mixed together. And now I'm adding that to the dry ingredients here. And I'm just going to lightly um, whisk that but I wanted to add a little bit of love to show you. And being a woodland tribe, uh, when you refer to wild rice, there are so many different varieties of wild rice, but this one here that I wanted to show you, and I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in my hand because it's absolutely beautiful. So you can see, this is harvested from my friend Jack. And Jack is from, uh, Red Lake, Minnesota, and he goes out with his grandsons in the canoe and he teaches them about how to traditionally harvest rice and then he shows them how to uh, parch that rice on an open fire without breaking 
a significant amount of grains, which is kind of hard to do. It takes a lot of skill. And he spends the time at the end of the summer with his grandsons doing this every year. And so Jack's rice is, to me, good as gold. It's the most valuable. When he calls me up, I, I just say yes. Like, whatever you want to charge me for your rice, Jack, I'll pay it. And I will take as much as you have to share because there is so much love and good intention. And you know that every time I eat this rice or I talk about it, and I think about Jack that those good feelings and vibes are going to his family and they know that in continuing on these practices, it will continue to nourish them differently. You know, sourcing and, and gathering these foods is a completely different type of nourishment for your body and it is all part of our traditional food system. And I really do think that that is applicable to, you know, anybody that's connected to a culture. It isn't. It doesn't even necessarily need to be yours, but it's just that connection uh, to something a little bit deeper and, and bigger. And knowing that, you know, if something is universal, but also as as vastly unique to everybody. You know, even preferentially, what flavors you like. It, it's something. Food is universal, but it's so diverse and it's so beautiful, and it's a wonderful way to communicate with each other and. Um, I always kind of like to think that when I cook this way, it, it is my grandma's communicating with me and, and putting those memories in and it, even in isolation or, you know, when you have these moments where you need to have an epiphany to change, which is, you know, essential for life. It's that connection and being able to, you know, say, I remember making this soup with my grandma outside and I remember the way the wind felt and the way the sun felt and the way her voice sounded or the way the, the fire crackled and and how all of that kind of you know affects you so i have this batter and it's just like a regular uh waffle batter except it, it's a little bit lumpier because it does have the wild rice in it and i'm going to go ahead and put it in the waffle iron and i chose to use maple sugar for this uh, you can use white sugar but it, it does kind of change a little bit and it's beautiful because it's the sweetness of life that we're after and we're really looking to share that more so than the flavor but for us maple is also got these amazing enzymes in it that are considered medicine and so the blue corn in the waffles or however you want to use it connects you to the ancestors and it's a way that they say it is a communicator and then you have this maple syrup which is this wonderful medicine you know that the purest from the trees it comes from the earth and it's filtered and and births this beautiful sweetness that comes um, you know after the long winter and then uh, I like to add berries to my waffles especially blueberries or cranberries in, in a compote. I like to you know, kind of cook these down together because the blueberry and the cranberry works really well together and it gives you this acidic, sweet bite. Um, but I also like to just put the plain fresh blueberries on a plate and, and top it with a little bit of the pure maple syrup. And uh, one of my uncles had told me that the maple syrup really does change you, you know, like we even use the sap that comes out of the trees in some spring ceremonies because it's it like wakes everything up and so it's got a lower glycemic index maple and i think it just kind of i mean it's so different when you try pure maple syrup as opposed to you know something that has a, a lot of modifiers in it and is you know synthetically made it's a completely different experience so i definitely would recommend switching to maple but it all goes around this food is medicine and the mindful intention that we have when we cook and when we consume and the connection that we can have from sharing a meal as simple as a waffle with some syrup for breakfast or if you know you share some wild rice or anything that is grown with the intention or you know with with preservation in mind when it comes to these ancestral corns those have been, you know, grown in our communities 
they, there's creation stories that include our food sources like that. And that's how highly they're revered that not only were they sewn into people's clothes to preserve them, they have their own journey of strength and resilience, which is really what life is about, is these journeys of strength and resilience and how we become better from all of these lessons. And I think that the seed journey kind of helps navigate us and, um, you know, show us how to relate that to life, if that makes sense. You know, seeds grow these deep roots and they get nourishment from the earth and they are there for generation to generation if they're preserved and cared for, just kind of like we are. And those are the teachings that we have when we learn about our foods from a young age. Those are things that I remember my great grandmother talking to me about and my grandmother talking to me about and, um, you know, making sure that it's our responsibility as humans to not only treat each other well and to care for each other, but to care for the land and to care for the plants and the animals and all of these things that work together or traditionally did work together in a way that, you know, we all were able to thrive. So I'm just gonna check this quickly and see where our waffle is at. And it's just about there. So I'll grab a plate, get some of my stuff down here for you to see. And this waffle out a little bit. So you can kind of see, and I'm going to break this up, but it is so beautiful, the colors inside of these waffles. You can even see the little pieces of corn and how they've bloomed. And uh, it's, it's just a sweet, beautiful goodness. You just have to put a little bit of berries or whatever you'd like. Now, uh, I know that we kind of like to do a version of chicken and waffles and do a turkey breast with waffles and have it be savory. Uh, I just encourage people to try flavors regardless of whether or not they're indigenous. Try something new. Know that there's a story behind it. Know that people appreciate that in some way and you can get a connection from something as, as simple as a bite in the end. So I'll just finish this off and you can see I'll tell you that uh, my, my daughter's over here waiting for this plate to be finished. <laughs> but it's just a basic waffle. It's delicious. You can taste the maple. You can taste the, uh, the berries, the blue corn, and it all kind of blends together into this wonderful sweet bite that helps you appreciate the sweetness of life. So I wanted to share that. I'll send out the recipe so that we have um, it on the link and I think that's it. If anybody has any questions. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't wait to see the ladies cook too. Thank you very much, um, Elena. This is actually quite, quite informative. Um, I'm particularly interested in the, in that, what you just did with that waffle is from scratch. It's not from a packet. It's not from a, a you know, a pre-mixed thing. And so I think what that demonstrated is the return to the origin, return to where we come from. You know what I'm saying? Um, I got a couple of questions here and Elton, who is still with us, talked about, gave a, 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 um, a description about the wild rice. Um, but I had a couple of questions. Um, that uh, that maybe you might be able to answer quickly before we move on. Um, so they're asking you to send out the recipe and somebody, Aaron is asking, where did you get the wild rice? Um, and Elton talked a little bit about the native tribes going out in their canoes and harvesting the rice from the, from, from, from the river. Um, it's, he says it's traditionally, traditionally in the traditional lands and waters, particularly among the tribes in the Minnesota area. They go out in canoes and husk the rice from the rivers, waters, then dried. Some tribes like Red Lake tribes sell their wild rice. It's getting scarce to harvest for tribes and for the tribes as corporations are coming in to the ancestral lands and harvesting with machines. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, 
so maybe just the one question where would, where would somebody be able to pick up the wild rice to get wild rice so white earth tribe is a good source for wild rice and they are out of minnesota i also work with um, ZB Mijawang Farm in Michigan, and it really is a wonderful Great Lakes thing. If you have a chance though, to get a hold of somebody's hand parched, hand harvested wild rice, do it. Because it is something completely indescribable compared to a cultivated wild rice. And you're also supporting the, the local native economy and you know small family, that are trying to continue this way. but it does take you know I even with me foraging everybody always wants to go foraging until it's time to go foraging it's a lot of work you know walking out in the woods or you know being out in a canoe all day and then knowing that what you harvested must be processed you know that you have timelines and stuff and so if you ever have a chance and you can there are tribes that you can reach out to especially in Wisconsin Michigan and Minnesota that you can get some of that hand harvested, traditionally processed wild rice, do it because it is something that is, it's indescribable in flavor as opposed to the cultivated wild rice. And it is technically a grass. It's something really amazing. So if you get a chance to try it. Thank you very much again, Elena. And community members, let's, 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 <laughs> let's give thanks to <laughs> Elena for, for her presentation. Um, okay. Uh, actually, I need to. Ooh. Okay, so the next. Um, so next up, I'd like to um, to share and introduce our new. Our, our next uh, presenters, um, chefs MJ Mavis, Mavis, uh, Mavis J. Sanders and Cicely Sierra, founders of Food People Plus Food NYC. Yep. So just briefly, um, Chef Mavis J. Sanders cooked at Blue Hill at Stone Barnes, Blue Hill, and Unite Untitled in New York later becoming part owner of the award-winning food truck Pico House in Los Angeles. She returned to New York as a director of operation at the Brownsville Community Culinary Center. And in 2019, she was honored as one of the star chefs, New York Rising Star Chef. Chef Mavis J is a James Baird Chef's Boot Camp alum and a Chef's Collaborative Scholar and is frequently a featured chef of the New York Queer Soup Night. She's now a co-founder of Food Plus People, an organization celebrating Black culture and community through food. And with Chef Mavis J is Chef Cicely Sierra. She became a successful actress as a Power Ranger and on the primetime family comedy, One on One. After graduating from Le Cordon Bleu, she started an internship at the Los Angeles Times Test Kitchen, where to get with her mother, co-founded Pinky and Reds as part of La Cochina's incubator program. These two chef restauranters started Food Plus People and say, we believe quality food is a human right, not a luxury. Community members, I'd like us to welcome MJ and Cicely. MJ and Cicely, welcome. Oh, yes, I've got no more. Wow. <laughs> okay. um, yes. yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm, I'm Cicely for clarity. I'm Cicely. I'm Cicely. <laughs> this is Mavis Jay and I'm Cicely. Um, and today we're just going to, we're going to start into cooking right away. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to jump in it because we want to start things low. just for time yeah, yeah. wise. Uh, and then every time get on, get on, get on, get on down. Um, so we are, oh, me. Oh, I'm cooking today. Um, uh, comfort is our jam and I'm just going to use one. I'm going to be a gangster. Um, so this dish is, is something that is super easy. It's like a one pot dish because when we think about cooking, specifically cooking at home, um, and, and our products are centered in that is this idea that 
you want to be able to do something that's super easy that you love that really inspires you to cook and one thing especially that hate people hate when cooking is dishes so this is a dish that legit you need a pan we had a mixing bowl and if you didn't do that it's okay too because i didn't the first time and then a cutting board and a knife for all your stuff um so to jump in we are using um chicken thighs there's mm -hmm. bone in skin on thigh meat <laughs> um and it's optional like you don't have to use chicken you can use whatever roasts well and that may be no meat at all um and so we used to marinate it is um our seasonal seasonal mild hot sauce um because when we created our product line we wanted it to be shelf stable ingredients that people could use um with anything the idea with our products was like all you needed was one thing right like because we live in a food desert now and with the work that we do we acknowledge that a lot of people live in food deserts so we don't want you to feel like you have to compromise anything in your eating experience with our products right like it's like don't feel like it's not a good thing to shop the center of the aisle so um the the marinade is the seasonal mild sauce and it's really cool because the base of it is leeks so it has this like oniony sweet flavor and then it's also seasoned with the um, sweet and smoky spice rub so it's been sitting since about i want to say ooh, like about an hour and a half yeah. and so to start this dish fyi you can totally do this my cheated for television experience is not this um, we're going to go in the pan, skin side down. Two things I want to say. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going skin side down. Smooth that out for me. If you were ever trying to get really sexy, really crispy skin, right quick, let's just talk about some cooking tips. Let's do it. Yes. You want to put a good amount of oil in the pan, enough to coat it in the bottom, right? But I also want you to use, um, a little bit of oil directly on the skin. Like, don't be scared. Thank you, tech people. Look at Is that. that Debbie? Look I at this camera. Right this is how you know, know you've one. been in doing Zoom go. for a while Here with your go. kids. Yeah, for sure. Okay, <laughs> so there's our chicken. We're actually going to make sure that we coat that skin really well. We're using grapeseed oil today, right? Go ahead. It's a neutral oil. Right, right, right. And it's it has a high smoke point. It has a lot of durability, right. um, which is nice because like one thing when we talk about mental health, we don't talk about the effects of food and how people of color don't have the same luxury as white people to get like allergy tested and all of these things. Put the chicken so, in the pan. Okay, We're so the FYI, pan. I'm gonna turn this pan away from me because I don't want this oil popping on my white shirt and I'm gonna put it skin side down. Hear that, hear that. Let's you hear want it. the sizzle because otherwise, if you just set it in hot oil for no reason, and then you wonder why you got like a coat full of lip gloss at the end, it's because your oil wasn't hot No enough. lip gloss is popping. So I'm tilting the pan away from me. So you see all the oil is down there. And then I'm going to drop my other one in. And then like <laughs> the waves crashing back. I'm just going to set it down. And then the oil will do its thing and come back to the rest of the chicken. But you want your pan hot enough, right? Because if it's not hot enough, your meat will never, if it's, not hot enough your meat will stick when it is i can move this and it won't stick because it's hot enough and i know it's going to do the thing that it that will need to do like seize the proteins like automatically is when you put the, put the oil down the other part is about having that heat high enough is i don't want soggy skin like yes. you want you want well skin. oiled glistening skin that ain't it so we're not sweating our chicken skin we're getting some color on it it's gonna be nice all right um <laughs> that so we're multitasking. So while it. our um, I'm gonna hit it. So while our um, skin is basically win rendering, um, if you you're gonna let the oil, we want the fat from the skin to cook out because it's gonna help coat our vegetables. So while that's going, we're going to talk about the vegetables that we have, which are um, sweet potatoes, onions different color bell peppers. These are red and orange and yellow. Brussels sprouts, um, radishes, or watermelon radishes, apples, potatoes, and I think that's it. I'm not gonna lie, the recipe on the screen said broccoli, but our broccoli was in the bottom drawer of our refrigerator and it froze. So we are really cooking with what we have at home. That's the beauty of Which cooking. Which is what you need to do anyway. Uh -huh. All right, cool. Don't go out to the store buying random stuff just because no, to complete a recipe. 
Use what's in your pantry. We're talking about pantry building eventually. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's go tech people. We're going to go back down to the cutting board. Let's talk about some veg. Maybe. Not there you go. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to start with this bell pepper? Yeah, start with the bell pepper. Okay, cool. Um, a lot of people um, hate cutting bell peppers because they're like, oh my God, there's a mess. It gets everywhere. Um, I don't want you to be afraid of that. I'm going to teach you a little hack in order to avoid that avoid getting the seeds everywhere. We're just going to cut off this end right here. Check your fingers. Expose. Whoop, here we go. Just as such. And when I'm looking at it, I can see inside these white ribs. And all those ribs are holding my seeds, right? So what I'm going to do with my knife is I'm just going to cut on the outside. Just shy of the rib. Of the rib. As such. Look at that. And all my seeds stay intact, like I'm in the middle right here, right? I'm gonna, I'm the kind of person I like to cut as far as close to the middle as possible. I don't want to waste nothing. You know what I'm saying? Waste not, won't not. Somebody said that. Oh. I mean, yes, a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people have said it. Yeah, I don't know who said it originally. I didn't want to be like, my mama said that, and everybody's mama said that. You know what I'm saying? Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan said it, guys. I don't know. That's not real. All right, cool. Not even do so, that. perfect for compost, right? We've got very minimal waste, right? And all this whole thing, bloop, right into compost. Here you go. Um, if you are somebody at home who struggles with having a sharp knife, dull knife, struggling with cutting bell peppers in general, I would actually suggest that you put them skin side down when you're cutting them. I know it's going to sound crazy. People are like, what? But this side right here, because of all these like ridges and stuff like that, makes it actually super easy, sorry, um, to cut them uh, like on this side. So we're just gonna do some nice slices. It's a good size for you. Also, really quickly, the pettiness in me. So yeah. let's say you do have people coming over mm -hmm. and you want to do something like this and they are really finicky, finicky, finicky. <laughs> um, and you want to be like, they're like, oh, I don't really like bell peppers or I don't really like this. Or you got kids like us and you want to trick them to eat all their vegetables. Just cut it a little smaller. You want me to cut this one small? And they'll never know. Um, no, that's fine. That's actually really pretty. Hey, you let me know. You, want me to cut it's, small you are like, Fantastic. I just want to make oh. you happy. Okay, smaller it is. Smaller we went. All right, cool. So, knife cut. So, this is, that's our hack for the day. If you didn't know, if you were having a little bit of trouble with your bell peppers and everything <laughs> like that, and I like to make sure I keep it clean when I'm cooking because of the simple fact that I hate cleaning up more. That's so, real. Yeah, yeah. All right, bet. Next up, what do you want to talk about? Um, so in this dish, so we had like, back in the day, we thought it'd be a really good idea to take our children apple picking. <laughs> and so we have all these apples and we don't eat apples like that, my God. Um, and never made a pie. And never made a pie, Didn't never pie. made apple cider, all the things that you think you're Who's gonna do with press? your life. I don't know. Why, it the, why can really you cute. only buy apples from the world in 90 pound sacks? <laughs> can, can you meet me in the middle? Okay, so we, we cut up apples as well to um, Mavis's um, favorite fra phrase, not give you palate fatigue, because we're gonna like layer the apples in here. So that way it'll give you like this little surprise of like, sweetness where people are like oh what is that and you'd be like girl it's a secret recipe but it's apple um so we just cut them around the core and layer the apples you want me to do this one? yes van white um and then once they're cut um though we love brown things we don't necessarily love oxidized things so um, we want to cover them with water, right? Because you always hear white people be like, you don't want to turn brown. Brown don't taste good. It does, but oxidized things don't taste good. Um, so we're going to, I'm getting a little burnt. Right it's here. a little cover. It's a little, color. It's a little um, color. So I'm going to turn this off because we're good here. So we can put it in a little bit of water. You can put a little acidulated water if you want. That acidulated part being... A little bit of lemon juice, if that was it. Yeah, I just squeeze lemon juice and I mix the apples and the potatoes together. It's fine. We're going to cook it all together. 
why make more dishes? Okay, chicken okay. is done, so we can go to work. Cool. Um, and then we got a little high low, and because we live in a food desert, we have to get restaurant deliveries. It's wild because all the restaurants deliver in our area, but I mean, they're, they house in our area, but they don't deliver to us locally. So we have to go the extra mile to get food. So we had watermelon radishes in our, our kitchen. So I was like, well, let's use that since, since I left the broccoli frozen, Ugh, not even in the same family, but they're really good and they're peppery and have a little bit of sweetness to them. Normally we eat them raw in a salad, but they look like really beautiful and they look like a watermelon in theory. So she's going to show you, she's going to peel it. And I would just slice it. So these are a thing that like, if you're nervous about pepper or the person you live with or shacking up with or just coming to visit, bay, you know whatever what I mean? it is. Yes. You want like a good time. Don't cut these so big because they are a little spicy. Right. But I do love one thing that this is kind of like a cute hack because like we do eat with our eyes. It's got a beautiful, vibrant pink color, right? Yeah. So whenever you guys start slicing this, if, if, you, if ever you're cutting something that's round and you're not comfortable about it, don't be afraid to just like do a little slice on the side, give you a flat surface that'll hold it steady. Yep. Um, oh, but what I wanted to show you was like when we talk about it being a watermelon radish for anybody who doesn't really have a lot of experience with this. It's so pretty, look it's at that. so gorgeous. So it gives your plate like a little bit of pop um, and they do hold well. A lot of the items that we're cooking with today hold well and that's really important. Like if you are coming from a lower income area or an area where you can't get fresh veg all the time, um, getting things that hold well in the fridge or hold well in like cool dark places like potatoes. We have all these potatoes, we have these onions and things like that, that it's not just gonna like wilt over like night. You know what I'm saying? Like we wanna use herbs, we love using fresh herbs, um, but we, like also have a lot of dried herbs in our pantry. Like we don't want to be afraid of using that. Give us all those flavors. And, and things typically as a person of color, you do. And then you'd be like, why do I have quartz on quartz and parsley? This is the time to use them. Right. Okay. So we can start layering this jive in. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take the chicken and set it to the side. I sabotage you. It's okay. I knew this Harry I was thinking the side. So I'm going to take this chicken and um, just set it to the side. This, I do want this, I'm not gonna lie, because this is actually a caramelization from brown sugar, just looks, you know, a little dark skin. So guys, our, our, our chicken is only halfway cooked. Yes, right? just so that is why right I put that on that pan. Um, so I'm gonna use my, my clean hands. My clean hands. And I'm just gonna take from the oil that I have and I'm just gonna layer this in here. Cool, so she started with those sweet potatoes. Um, sweet potatoes are definitely a staple in our diets. Um, they are, have some amazing health benefits. Um, you know, the orange part, the carotenoids, um, they say they- Yes, carotenoids, <laughs> you went to school? Uh, the carotenoids, My carotenoids. Uh, they say, or they, or the health experts say that they uh, lower your risk for cancer. Um, and uh, sweet potatoes also help control your blood sugar. Uh, so if you have diabetes, sweet potatoes are a great way to go. They also um, lower your LDL, LDL, which is bad cholesterol. Um, Not just so, Cheerio. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have um, less less chance of like uh, uh, heart problems or like heart disease, anything like that. Um, so sweet potatoes are pretty, pretty clutch. Of course, those carotenoids also, same thing to find in carrots. We're like, eat these carrots. It's great for your eyeballs. There you go. Um, so... What we're talking about the cuts here that she's that we did for this aren't hard by any means, right? Like, if I may, yeah. Um, well, when she when we cut this, we cut it in half and then just cut these like moons, right? And what's happening? What's gonna make this look nice? What's gonna give us that great presentation? All that eye candy that we love so much um, is how she's placing it, right? So it's not like there's a bunch of knife cuts. It's not like there's a bunch of like anything yeah, that's no. crazy difficult you can't do at home and for a lot of people and it'll take you a lot of time. You left the skin on, you just rinse, it. rinse the potato, right? Like leave the skin on, don't go wasting the food. Yeah. Don't, don't, that's not cute, right? Like use it all, fiber, fiber for your life. So many benefits, you know what like I'm saying? Like the end pieces keep of the you, bread. <laughs> it's, not, it's not how that works, but you know that fiber keep you 
slim thick during the quarantine, all right? Keeps you warm. Um, so yeah, I'm giving you real basic B right now, like not even like over the top fancy cut. Um, but what I will say is as one thing to keep in mind as I'm layering, I'm putting all the things that are harder to cook or take longer to cook on the outside. Because as you get to the center, it's all gonna pile up in a sense. And, and that stuff doesn't take long to cook. So I don't want like my potatoes um, to be undercooked and everything else to be burnt on the outside. So I'm going potatoes on the outside, both potatoes, the rest of it's, and the sweet potatoes. And then I'm gonna. Right. If that makes sense, right? Cause the thinner layer on the outside is gonna have, is gonna have a lot more heat, um, a lot more surface area for the heat. Whereas the things that pile up in the middle are gonna take longer for the heat to get to it. So it's gonna like not cook as long, if that makes more sense. So I'm gonna go in, um, I'm not that tall, Lord help me, um, with my just regular russets and I'm gonna pile them on top, like layer them on top just a smidge. And I don't want that many because really the sweet potato is in fact the star of the show. Right. But you see how I got this like ghetto spot right here. I'm gonna just take these potatoes and run it right back out there like that. So they'd be like, oh my God, look at your black version of a ratatouille. <laughs> Starchy ratatouille. Yeah. You're for it. <laughs> um, and then I'm also, so with my apples, because they're gonna leach out a good amount of moisture, I wanna put them in the, the center to help um, push all of that out for me. So I also understand like the work of my ingredients. The, the apples are gonna do the heavy lifting for that for me when I put the chicken back on top and the chicken starts to release its juices, right? So then I'm gonna go in with my red onions. Yes, red onions. And just, cause I want sprinkles. these to roast sprinkles, a little sprinkles. bit. Um, I like to use red onions instead of just general white onions. I think that they t tend to be a little bit more sweeter, have a little bit more flavor. Um, they have a lot of sulfides um which are important in building amino acids in your system which you is important to school. in building uh in like protein synthesis uh and that's like uh rebuilding your cells right um antioxidants and uh, anti-inflammatory right from the uh from the purple color um they are said to help build your immune system again we're talking about fiber uh for your digestion and uh, it's even rumored that red onions in particular help uh, with bone density and which is really important for or like rejuvenating bone dis density um, for people or um, who may be getting a little older and want to pay attention to things like that. So like an apple a day, an onion a day, it's going to be great, I promise. Also um, with these onions, um, when you cut it, you want to look for the lines of the onions because they, they are a living thing and they're porous, right? So I cut along the line, along the grain, because when you cut against the line, you tear the fibers and it makes for um, like more texture. If you think about like an onion ring and when you eat it, I used to hate it when I was a kid and you eat it and you can feel like the strands. So cutting with the grain gives you like a smoother, creamier onion. So for the folks who are like, oh, I don't like onions or quarantine bay, don't like onions. This is the thing that you want to do because it just is a softer, more simpler texture. All right. So bell peppers. I did not use green. I only used red, orange, and yellow because I wanted a brighter flavor. Green can give the illusion of like a heavier feeling in your mouth because of the taste and because we have so many potatoes and the apples i wanted to keep it lighter and sweeter and uh because our sweet and smoky spice syrup has a lot of brown sugar in it so i wanted to also play to that sweetness so i'm just gonna spread these around and then i'm gonna go for um our oh you want more bell peppers okay cool you told me to cut them small so yeah put them in there. so then i'm gonna add um, Brussels sprouts. And I'm also gonna put those around the edges just to be able to, um, I'm gonna start around the edges because I want them to crisp up. These guys have just been cut in half, right? Yeah, that's it. Real easy. Cause uh, like this is, Brussels sprouts are really this is my coming to town bed where the chicken is gonna go. Yeah. yeah so yeah. like, let's talk about this. This was literally one sweet potato, one russet potato, potato, about $2.50 worth of Brussels sprouts, one onion, 
a bell pepper well two because i got like multiple colors so this was not this was probably like the chicken was my biggest item but for all of these things it wasn't that much money um this was probably like and most of these things stay 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 for a long time in a long chuff life ask us how we know because they've been living in our kitchen (laughs) because we gotta buy in bulk bro right because we got kids (laughs) <laughs> Does anybody else have that quarantine kids and they just eat all day? All day. All you, day you don't eat like this at school. school. You don't do that, guys. Like, so I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna take some more oil. Yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. may look like a lot, but it's not. And the nice anything. thing is this is a neutral oil, so it doesn't taste like anything. Yeah. And then I'm going to um take this sweet and smoky spice rub. Everything is in this spice rub, so I don't have to add salt. And it looks like I'm seasoning heavy, but I promise you I'm not when you see the magic of television. And then I'm going to use the leek sauce that I marinated um, the chicken in. And I'm just going to drizzle it around. I don't want it all over because I want people to be like, oh, what is that? And I'll be like, girl, something I've been slaving over for years. They don't need to know. So the pantry hack here um, is, is like if you only have potatoes to the rest of quarantine. Um, your VIP move is going to be make sure that you do have a couple of good seasonings. You do have a, like, a couple of good sauces. So, and like that will stop you from getting that, what we were talking about earlier, the palate fatigue, where you just get bored of eating the same thing over and over and over and over again. Right. Um, like if you have um, you, just a couple things, you can switch it up so you don't sit here and it's at the same bite every, every, every single time. It gets boring. And this is like literally parsley that we had sitting in the cabinet. And so one thing, like if you don't buy a product, cool, whatever. But what I will say is smell the things, like smell the things that you have laying around in your kitchen. So if it smells smoky, if it smells sweet and you're trying to build different flavors, because as people of color, we'd be like, yeah, give me all the things from the spice market and all these things. So build it that way. So you have like these interesting um, flavors to play off of because you can redo this and and add more brown sugar, less brown sugar, all of these things, and it'll give you a totally different experience. All right, so then I'm put this in the oven. And then, oh my God, with the magic of television, it's gonna be done so fast. Listen, it was only three chicken breasts in my, I mean, chicken thighs in my pack. So one had to go in the previous and the other two with that one. Um, so this is kind of like what it looks like. This one roasted down really thin. So you see how it like all looks super tight and packed together. But in fact, it wasn't. It, it got to spread out and, and be super nice and delicious. And so for me, um, Mavis is like really great at plating and everything like that. But this is also a dish that like, you can if you you can set it on the table and everybody can eat family style out of and gather and have that conversation or if you're like me just let it cool down a little bit and eat it in the bed why do you want tv at the pan and all you need is a fork and you don't have to do this. legitimately what she'll do she'll like take the wooden cutting board and i'll put it and put it on the bed on the bed and then she'll put and i'll be like this pan i don't know directly on top of it and just be eating out of the pan. Yeah. I mean, guys, I stood up all this time, so I burned the calories in advance to be able to eat it in, its, in the bed. Um, but this is like something that's super simple, that's important. Um, because it's so basic that like, you don't, I think that living like for us, we live in a food desert and you look and you're like, we don't have a lot. We don't have, but there's a beauty in using what you do have. There's a beauty in the simple. And and these everything is like, well, for us, everything is like local or everything is like fresh. Um, and it's easy because sometimes we eat food and we don't consider processed food. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that like, that's all a person has and that's okay. But sometimes those things affect us. Like we have 850 million food allergies in our house and they don't, we don't break into hives. We don't do any of that. Like I have food allergies and when I, so this is very telling what I'm about to tell y'all. So don't judge me. Um, when I eat them, 
I don't have a normal rash, right? Like I, my eyes will swell. That's my reaction to them. And so I need glasses. And it's not that I need glasses in my normal life. If I ate the things that I wasn't allergic to, then I wouldn't need glasses. But that's something that we don't think about that like I had to like seriously do the work on because I felt like I was dying and couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And the doctor was like, is because you eating stuff that you have no business eating. Hello. Um, and that's a manifestation of your food allergy. So sometimes there are things that are happening to us. And, and as we have children specifically, um, we feed ourselves and don't know that like the community around us could potentially be doing harm and it manifests as something else. It, it manifests as stress. Like for me, when I eat my allergies, I grind my teeth at night and it gives me a headache and it's hard for me to function during the day. And I didn't necessarily know that like me grinding my teeth and getting these migraines was attributed to the things that I was allergic to. So it is real, like the things that we, you are what you eat and it's, it, it's hard to function sometimes. And we need to give ourselves enough grace with the things that we're eating in real life it's hard like i will be like okay for two weeks i'm not going to eat wheat or drink the things and then be like but today i'm gonna have a sandwich um you gonna try it it's hot it's hot i want brussels sprout. Brussels sprout. yeah yeah let's go okay all right i'll see you nice cuts this is nice because it gives you texture of being like crispy and soft and it's really beautiful and it's simple. This is so basic and um, it, it's literally like, do this for quarantine bay and you can do it bigger mm -hmm. and like Listen. feed you guys for a couple of days, like a couple of meals, you know what I'm saying? It's like a hearty. If you don't have the protein, don't worry about it. The veg mix itself is hearty. Yeah. Oh, there's plenty of starch happening in this pot, in this pan, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of contrast of flavors. There's the sweet, there's a little bit of bitter, like there's some peppery, um yeah it's gonna it's it's good there's some creamy there's some crunch still and it's nice for thanksgiving it didn't cost a lot of money oh. you don't go have to fight in line if you gotta fight for your toilet paper you shouldn't have to fight for your food too you know what i'm saying you have to get one of those things and not only that just because white people out here telling y'all y'all need to eat dry turkey fyi you don't have to like you can bake and do whatever you want like that's another thing like it's okay for us to lean back to the things that raised us and do all of those right. things. Sometimes it's not for us to live in the colonized thought of how we should be living and approaching our food. That is not the gold star standard. It's about the thing that brings you joy, the thing that brings you peace, the thing that makes you happy, the thing that makes you feel healthy and feel good about you. If you can't afford a 36 pound turkey, that's okay. Like there's no shame in that. You should be able to feed yourself well and love on yourself and have a good warm meal and a space and try to create a nurturing um, environment for your body that suits you best. All right, we appreciate y'all <laughs> for hanging with us and eating with us, snacking. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I'm actually really excited and interested in that dish that you guys prepared. Um, I've never come across watermelon radish before, so I'm going to try that. And I do use a lot of sweet potato myself, so I believe in it. That's why um, you're so good. Look at you. Uh, well, until I can afford to buy an air fryer so I can have season uh, sweet potato fries, which yeah. I just think are the bomb. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't laugh. Cause there are a lot of people who will laugh at you to hear me say that. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions for you guys, and then we're going to go into the um, discussion, which you guys are going to be a part of. Um, hang on. People are still coming in. Welcome. Um, <laughs> Welcome. So um, somebody asked the question about um, what temperature and for how long are you going to cook all that stuff that you just prepared and put in the pan? So um, initially, I put this on. Maybe this one. Hi. Yes. Hello. <laughs> um, so initially, I put it on. I turned it up. OK, so if you didn't crisp your chicken and all that before, I put everything, like let's say you wanted to do it in a sheet pan, I put the this dish 
up to like 450 for like 10, 15 minutes. And then I brought it down to 350 and let it cook for like another 30, 40 minutes because I just wanted to make sure that the chicken was done and the juices ran clear and that our um, russet potatoes were fully cooked. The rest of the potatoes and the chicken are probably what takes the longest. Takes the longest, time. yeah. Um, I would adjust that time based on also like we specifically had bone in chicken, which yeah. takes a little bit longer to cook, right? Um, and also holds like help holds in some of that moisture and flavor in the chicken, um, so it can it can cook a little bit longer, right? If you're using like a boneless breast or something like that, a lot shorter cooking time. time. Yeah, a lot shorter cooking time. And then of course, if you don't have any meat in it then I guess the time will be shorter because you only have to concentrate on the potatoes. Yeah, yeah, you just want sweet potatoes kit are the easiest thing. So if you didn't want to overstress about like making sure that everything was done, honestly, if you omitted the like russet potatoes, um, I just love them because they're cheap and you can get them and they're bountiful and all that thing if you're feeding you yourself. Stretch or, a meal. Yeah, if you want to stretch a meal. But the russet potatoes were the thing that took the longest. So you just, if you're doing no vegetables, you just want to no make meat. sure, no meat, no vegetables, <laughs> Jesus. Um, you just want to make sure that the, the russet potatoes are fork tender and like fully cooked through. Okay, thank you. I have another question here. What would you sub in if you can't find it for this recipe? If you can't find watermelon radish or Brussels sprouts? Um, I mean, you can do spinach in here. You can really do, so the thing about like this dish is really whatever you like. Like if you wanted to put broccoli in, if you wanted to put- um, You could do cauliflower. If you, you could do regular find, cabbage. Particularly if you can't find watermelon radish, you can use like one of those breakfast radish or red radishes they the have- The little cute small ones. At the store. I just like this because it adds a little bit of pepperiness to it. If you can't find that and you want to go with like, um, like at right in the end or like stir into your situation while it's coming straight out of the oven, like stir in some um, arugula, yeah. Right. Like most places you can find that somewhere. It gives you a little bit more greenery in this situation and um, it'll wilt against all the hot potatoes mm -hmm. and um, it has a good amount of pepperiness to it as well. Yeah. I mean, or you can sub spinach and you can use like crushed red pepper flakes to give you that same. Yeah. Or cabbage because cabbage is an expensive yeah, yeah. and cabbage is a bountiful thing. And, and just a little, little red pepper flake. And yeah, that's true, too. Uh, we got Elton here asked a question. He says, did I hear that you have products to use or sell? Can you provide info? So what I would suggest you do is when we go to the panel discussion time, that will give you an opportunity to put your link in the chat box so that those who are there, they can get access to your link. And already on it. Sean, shout out to Sean, has put the link <laughs> for our website. Are, are you got, really? Yeah. Me. Go ahead. Thanks. So while I was talking, this is going on. I uh, look at this community pouring into you. Yeah, make yeah, it so yeah. much easier. All mm. right. All right. So we're going to transition to the next segment, which is a discussion. So you guys are going to hang on for a minute. Okay. Elena is still here. Um, we want to welcome Yusuf, who is also here. So just hang on for a second. Um, let me just switch screens for a minute. Okay. Um, okay, so can you guys see my screen? So, all right, so our next segment um, is a discussion on food, mental health, HIV, uh, COVID-19, LGBT people of color communities. And this, 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 this segment will be moderated by um, James Baird Foundation's Vice President for Community Relations. Um, 
Colleen Vincent. And um, one of our panelists is uh, Reverend Michael Crumpler, who is with the Unitarian Universalist Association of New York. And he serves as the LGBT and Multicultural Program Director at the Unitarian Universal Association. He's an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. Michael lives in Harlem and is very active in the social justice ministry at the historic Judson Memorial Church of New York City, where he served as president of the board from 2016 to 2018. He's passionate about intersectional ministry centered on blackness, queerness, HIV, AIDS, economic justice, and emotional well-being. Michael has published in two groundbreaking works related to HIV and AIDS on curating issue 42, What Don't You Know About AIDS Could Fill a Museum and Spiritual Care in the Age of Black Lives Matter. And um, additionally, oh, we want to welcome um, Yusuf Benrella, um, okay. So we want to welcome Yusuf Benrella, who is, um, who has been recommended to us by Elena. Uh, you guys met Elena who did the preparation, the demo before about those wild rice and, and blue corn and uh, waffles. Um, that's like, I'm really looking forward to trying that at some point. But Yusuf Benrilla um, is a chef at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, De Jope Residence Hall. De Jope translates to four lakes in the native Kochuk language and a Trade Roots Culinary Collective, a group of Afro-culinary genealogists exploring lineage to food that Ben Rilla co-founded with Devon Hamilton and Candy Flowers. Originally developed for a trip to Africa for a documentary with culinary genealogist Michael Twitty, Trade Roots was named after the trade routes of the African diaspora and through food ways, challenging us to understand the sources of our cultural cuisines. Take soul food, for example, Yusuf says, you wouldn't have cornbread without corn. How did that story of corn begin? Trade Roots now teaches Afro-culinary traditions to youth and students with pop-ups around Madison, including Badger Rock Community Center. So community members, I'd like us to welcome Michael Crumpler, Yusuf Benrilla, Mavis J. Sanders, Cicely Sierra, Elena Terry, and all of this pulled together and moderated by Colleen Vincent. Colleen, are you there? Where are you? I can't see you. What do you look like today? <laughs> Colleen? Right here. I'm right here. I'm having a little bit of uh, internet difficulty, so I might have to switch. To yes, I'm here. I might have to switch devices midstream, just so you know. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Hi. Okay, good. So um, first, I want to acknowledge that um, my name is Colleen Vincent. I reside on Lenape land, um, where they planted corn, tobacco, and fished in the rivers. Um, and we are part of, you know, even though we don't like to say this here in Brooklyn, we are part of Long Island, um, which is now occupied by the Shinnecock. So, you know, I just wanted to acknowledge that. I wanted to say thank you to Anton for putting this together. Thank you for Debbie, um, to Debbie for pulling all the pieces together. I wanna to thank um, everyone for your participation and support, um, you know, and I'm very excited to be here um, and kind of a reclamation of um, Thanksgiving as both, you know, harvest season, but also as it stands next Thursday is also a national day of mourning that we can transform into um, a day where we can uh, actually celebrate um, culture and heritage of the original people of this land and those that um, were brought to this land by force. So I want to acknowledge all of those things um, and start talking about how 
in reclaiming this holiday, um, how it means so much more, um, how it means so much more in a year where um, COVID-19 has ex ex kind of um, exposed um, the social inequities that we're all familiar with personally to those that may have not been able to um, see it um, see it until now. Um, and so first I'd like to ask both Michael and Youssef to um, kind of offer their perspective on 2020 as it relates to people of color and certainly the LGBT community. I know there's a lot going on and there's a lot to um, kind of put in our thoughts, but you know, I figured between a preacher and a chef, we can, we can um, get a, a wonderful insight and perspective. So um, Youssef, we'll start with you. Um, since you are a guest here in New York, we'll start with you. Well, thank you for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. So I'm Yusuf Bedrilla. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I'm a chef. Um, I'm a farmer now. And um, yeah, like what we were saying, well, what you were saying earlier about how COVID really exposed some of the disparities in the communities and in the food systems. And also, I think it also um, opened people's eyes to how close you can be to running out of food. So a lot of people, they couldn't get to grocery stores. All of a sudden grocery stores are uh, closed. People couldn't get the items that they needed. And I think that there's not now more interest than ever in being able to produce food for yourself, being able to produce food for your community and neighbors. Um, so, you know, that's kind of like, where our mission has been headed for a while, even before COVID and the um, resurgence of the BLM stuff, we were um, already heading into a African diaspora farming situation, or um, that was our goal anyway. So, and with COVID, you know, things that we also realize here, I live in Wisconsin, we're at 43 degrees North. It gets pretty cold here for a lot of the year. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about what can be grown from the diaspora. And um, so I co-founded Trade Roots Afro Diaspora Gardens with Christian Keeves and uh, Rue Ganger. And we, you know, basically we're going to grow everything that we can at our latitude from our diaspora. And that includes sorghum, okra, collards, sweet potatoes. Um, sweet potatoes isn't a native plant of Africa, but it's become part of our diaspora because that's our yam. Our, our ancestors, my ancestors looked at sweet potatoes like, hey, this is like similar to our yam. Um, so they call them yams. And, um, and watermelon, agusi, uh, the list goes on. We grew uh, Benny seeds. So basically all these different plants that we were told in some instances couldn't grow here, we were able to grow and then feed our and help feed our community. So we fed roughly 70 families per week with organic donations um, through Badger Rock and other sources, uh, other outposts in Madison. Uh, throughout the entirety of COVID, we were able to feed 70 families organic produce and food. Um, I've done a lot of work with Elena Terry on Afro indigenous intersections. Uh, uh, briefly in my introduction, I spoke about cornbread and the intersectionality of corn and cornbread. Where did that come from? Where did that start? So those are just questions that I've been asking myself and like diving into um, more, more and more. And I think that, you know, as oppressed people, um, our LGBTQ community, our native community, black community, all of our uh, people of color you know, our struggle for just, you know, just to even have safety in our lives, you know, let alone the other struggles that we have with food safety and security and stuff like that. So I think that this has been a galvanizing moment. And I think that it also is, um, you know, a big wake, wake up call for a lot of people. Those of us that have been in it for a while, we're like, okay, it's about time. But then, you know, it's, you know, no better time now than to keep our doors open 
and to welcome people. And other pe and on another group that often gets overlooked is uh, handicapped and disabled people. We're working with a couple gentlemen now to get some uh, work on crops and harvesting and planting with people that often get left behind, um, our seniors and our disabled folks. So I just wanted to give a shout out to those folks too. Um, and sorry if I got a little off topic, as I'm super excited and caffeinated to be here, but um, yeah, so like what we're doing now is we're, you know, we're starting Trade Routes 43. And so what we're saying is with this, what we can grow here in Wisconsin, and it's winter six months of the year, you know, find your latitude. Find, we'll find, we'll help you find what crops will grow best in your community. And we want to spread this. We want to share the seeds. We're not doing this as a profit thing. We're going to give it away. We're growing seeds to start seed sharing and seed saving. And, you know, I think some of us got a glimpse into what doomsday preppers must kind of think like, because you're like, okay, here's my top 10 survival things. I need, you know, I need a knife. I need matches. I need this. I think very few people think about seeds, but our ancestors must have, because they knew wherever they were going, they're going to need something to grow. So I don't even think that seeds make it onto people's top 20 list because they think it, this might only last a few days, but what if it doesn't? Then what do we do? So yeah, seeds for survival was something that our ancestors held dear and we wouldn't be here without that. So that's something to think about, but I'll pass, I'll pass the mic. Michael. Yeah, so thank you so much. I just wanna begin by saying I have, I have been given so much life through this entire thing, uh, through this entire like program. Um, Food is so important, laughter is so important and being free and in, in, in how we express ourselves and what our needs are and privileging that is just so wild and it shouldn't be, but it is and I'm feeling it. So thank you so much, Elena and Cicely and Yusuf uh, for your gifts. Um, I will be calling you <laughs> to share you with others because um, we have to do that. Um, so yeah, I. Um, Wow, I, COVID, um, you know, I think that we spend so much time just uh, assimilating. And I don't mean that in like a derogatory sense. I just mean that like assimilation is survival in this, in this, in this world that we live in. Like you need a job, you need a house, you need, you need clothes, you need friends, you need sex, you need all the things. And, you know, for the most part, we spend so much energy like figuring out like the, the code, like, like what, am I on the right track? Am I catching the right train? Am I, you know, you know, am I educated? Am I, you know, am I, is my salary enough? How do I negotiate that? And I think that like for people from marginalized communities and I don't even like that term for people who live in spaces that have been marginalized by white supremacy, um, you know, like you're finally like catching up. I'm like 30, 40, 46 years old, not 30, nothing, 46 years old. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm like, I'm fine. I'm there. You know, like, I got it. I got it. You know, I live in Manhattan. I, you know, I got a Zoom. I got a Mac, you know. And I think that, uh, you know, when, uh, when, uh, when tragedy happens, you're like, bloop. Like, oh, shoot. I, I, I had all those things, but I had $5 in the bank. Like, we're constantly trying to fit in and figure things out. And I think that for, for, for a lot of us, what COVID exposed is just how vulnerable we are. And, you know, so much of, the life that we live is just, you know, just arriving to the party. And, and, uh, and then you realize when everything's sort of taken away and the things that you work for are still important. Like it's important to have a home. It's important to have like, it's important to have housing. It's important to have healthcare. It's important to be employed. It's important to have community. But like, I think what COVID has done is just kind of like it exposed the crevices and the cracks and the veil uh, like between the things that we value. And, you know, like just hanging out with a friend in a coffee shop, you know, going to church, going to therapy, going to a 12 step meeting, going to all the things like going to the grocery store, everything requires thought from, you know, putting on a mask to standing six feet away. At the beginning, it was sanitizing your hands. Um, uh, and, and I think it's just kind of brought to bear everything. 
And what is it that I really need? Do I do I need to be healthy? Do I need is is my health more important than than my sex life? Um, is my sex life more important than flying to you know Nebraska <laughs> to visit family? You know how can I have am I am I spiritually fit enough to to have to have a holiday alone with with quarantine bay as uh, Sicily? You know is that is that enough? And you know and is Zoom enough? Is it am I am I fulfilled? You know um, can I say no whenever someone invites me out? You know they shouldn't be going out. Can I say no? So all of these decisions that I've never had to think about before have been brought to bear. Um, you know, I know people who are using more drugs uh, irresponsibly because of COVID. I know people who are using less drugs and are able to stay healthy because uh, of, of, of the instant connections and opportunities that Zoom gives for. So I know that's a lot, but these things are important um, in the I had um so I I don't know what you know folks is um you know comp you know around religious language but I'm a minister and uh in 2019 a, a church in Brooklyn reached out to me and asked me to be their sabbatical minister which basically means that the minister of the congregation is is going to go away for some rest and it was supposed to be from like March to June and so like sure I can do that you know. Um, and so I was a sabbatical minister at this, you know, um, well-known church in Brook Brooklyn for three months. And my, my, my sabbatical began right at the beginning of, my sabbatical began right at the beginning of COVID. So all this stuff is happening, you know, and, and like I had to all of a sudden figure out with this community how to uh, move their entire institution into an online universe. And, you know, as well as like, how do you do visits? How do you do drop-ins? How do you deliver food? How do you do all these things? And and it impacts everybody. You know, how do you do a funeral uh, whenever, you know, in, in a time of COVID? All these, I thought I was just gonna be preaching y'all. I didn't know I was gonna have to do all of that, you know? And so it just brings everything to bear. How do you have community? I absolutely love, love, love the cooking because it's something again, that we don't think about much until you know like for most people y'all probably think about it all the time just y'all y'all think about it all the time i don't think about it that much my partner thinks about it a lot more than i do which is why you know sometimes i'll be looking like what we're we gonna eat he's gonna be like chinese food so like we they, you know i don't think about it that much but it's so important prior to covid we um i started this black queer brunch um and i started this black queer brunch right i know y'all are ready you're coming you're coming you're gonna come and cook for us that'll be like our celebration um i started this brunch because uh as black queer men um and and and, and women and trans folk a lot of the community that we gravitate toward initially when we're just coming out or what have you particularly when we're leaving the black 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 church culture that is generally not very receptive to our you know living with a man you know <laughs> um like so we, so anyway, we, we found ourselves very familiar with white spaces, but unfamiliar with one another in those white spaces. It's like you show up and everybody's kicking over here to the side. We were like, there's one of us over there, but I'm over here. So anyway, I realized that I wasn't as um, friendly with folks who looked like me in, in Chelsea, let's just be clear, at the center. And so we created this brunch to get to know one another. And it's been happening since 20, uh, 2016. Um, and and it's, and we built a community out of it, really like a black, queer, and trans universe of folks who get together uh, to to basically be family together. And the sadness is that like that hasn't been happening. Our last meeting was at the beginning of March, when we shouldn't have been getting together. And we got together, and I was in there like, don't touch things, and you know, let me serve food, and all those kinds of things because we didn't know what was going on. So anyway, the sadness, the good part is that we've kind of still connected uh, every week more so than every month via Zoom. But these are the things that we've had to think about. And, and with everybody, it's different. So I'm not gonna say it's like this for all black queer people um, because for everybody is different. I think the hardest part is trying to decide how do I stay connected? Do I hang out with this person with a mask? Do I just hook them up on a Zoom or do I just text this brother? So it's just, it's just causes um, every aspect of our lives to be questioned.
while we're also always have ever been questioning every aspect of our lives. Thank you, Michael. And, and you know, I just wanted to like chime in um, in thinking about, you know, what community means and what community looks like, especially for marginalized people. Um, you know, Antoine started this conference around LGBTQ plus um, mental health. And, you know, it is a known fact that um, people who um, have HIV um, are more prone to depression, not just because of, um, not just because of their status, but literally it's, it's one of the, it's an aspect of the condition. And so, you know, of course, nutrition is of paramount importance. Um, but when you have a community that's marginalized by, um, by status, um, by, um, you know, orientation, by, um, by race, um, and so many things, um, you know, intentional community comes, becomes that much more important. And so what happens is a lot of our communities kind of gravitate towards unhealthy things um, because unhealthy things provide that sense of community, allow people to connect um, because, you know, a lot of people um, don't know how to connect otherwise, you know, either they weren't given the skills by a family that, you know, wasn't as supportive and loving as accepting as it should be. Um, but that being said, you know, what I know, you know, anecdotally of people of color in general is that we are all very communal in, in stark contrast to the more mainstream, um, the more mainstream um, um, American populace. And so because this is something that's kind of rooted in not just traditions, but like straight up heritage and bloodlines, you know, how do we, how do we access, how do we find a new way to access community? Um, and how do we find a new way to nourish ourselves, you know, both spiritually and also physically, like, for example, some of our most marginalized members include trans folk, right? Trans folk of all metrics, socioeconomic metrics, suffer the most um, and are, you know, receiving the least amount of help. So how do we as a community assist um, people and how do we help people, you know, empower themselves to access community? Um, I'm throwing this out very specifically to Michael, but if anybody else wants to chime in, you know, I'm happy to, you know, hear that as well. I think we all are. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we have to realize that all people need the same thing. Right? Like, I don't know. I, I mean, I, from an equity lens, right? Equity means those who need the most get the most. Um, and so I, I, I certainly hear you in that regard, but I think that all people need, you know, community, nu nutrition, you know, safety, you know, in, you know, housing, all people need um, all of these things. And, and I mean, we're, in, you know, we, we, I think the perception is that we live in a, an accountability responsibility culture that what happens to you is your fault um um and you know things happen to you not at you and i just i always like to try to like invert those things like actually most of what happens to um people of color people who are queer people who are trans people who are living with hiv people who are who are using who are who are who are, who are drug users um most it, people who are, who are criminalized, most of what happens happens at them. And I think that, um, you know, one of the, th one of the phrases I, I, uh, that just really like fired me up when we were out in the street is like, you know, we, we keep us safe. Who keeps us safe? We keep us safe. And I think that like that to me is constantly like, you know, playing in my head, you know, who keeps us safe? We keep us safe. And we have to like, be mindful, right? Because, you know, together we can dismantle the, the systems of oppression, but also like individually, I gotta survive. Like, I don't know if I'm going to this march today, 
I don't know if I'm going to this, you know, like I got it. So it's, 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 we have to like fight systems of oppression, but also protect one another in our personal relationships until we get to that space. And so, so I think that making sure that all of our spaces are equitable, making sure that our Zooms have closed captioning when available and that we're naming it, you know, making sure that we are, um, you know, if we believe that those who uh, need the most get the most, making sure that those people get to speak first, you know, even in these like, so it's just like the little things, showing up however you can when you can and making that person feel centered whenever they're in, they're in front of you, you know, um, not as like a political <laughs> statement, but as a personal statement, because our politics are one thing, but how we treat one another is another thing. And I think that, you know, we have to like live it out because again, for some of us, um, we're never gonna see that day where, 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 where uh, the police, where, where we defund the police. We're never gonna see that way where, where prisons are, 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 are abolished, but they can be abolished and defunded in our personal relationships. Thank you. If I could add, may I yes. add a little something, Colleen? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. you know, I think this is a perfect example of that as well in, in creating a space where interaction is positive without, you know, walls up, where I can say, I appreciate you for being a beautiful person and for sharing in this wonderful way and not having those conversations be ego driven at all. But, but to say that, you know, Reverend Michael, it's, I love your words and they resonated and, you know, ladies, I felt it when you said, it, you know, we try not to use food deserts because, you know, for somebody that's a forager, a desert is a really plentiful place, but a food junkyard is a little bit more of what we've kind of been forced to have mm -hmm. to be in, you know, coming from a, somebody who was raised on government rations, like, you know, commodities, food commodities. I know the canned meat. I know, you know, a, a lot of the Come process on, that's so unhealthy, but it's a connection and we know, and we made it, you know, it was lunch and meat. I think, I think that was the name for it, but yeah. <laughs> yes. but it's a connection and it's a commonality that we have. And it was never a struggle to me as a child having to deal with that. It wasn't until I was older that I realized like what an unhealthy way to have to sustain, but we were able to make meals out of it. And it wasn't just meals for us. If we had extra, we took it to the neighbors and they did the same for us whenever there was, you know, it's this wonderful sense of being able to build a community under the basis, like we are here together and whatever makes you unique and individual, which sometimes does cause a little bit of emotional struggle for all of us, you know, on, on any level, I don't know anybody that's exempt from that. It's about saying that I think it's beautiful in you. And I love to know more about what you have to offer and creating a space where those conversations can thrive. Like, I'm just so blessed. Thank you for including me in this conversation because I like what you said, uh, Michael, I really just feel this wonderful sense of warmth. And, you know, we are mm -hmm. entering a time where people celebrate a mass genocide of our people where our lives were changed forever. And I don't like lingering in, in the words trauma or, mm -hmm. you know, hurt or hardship. I like to say like, what a beautiful, strong, resilient bloodline I come from. We are still mm -hmm. here. You are all still here. And now we have the decision right now today to say that we will change this for tomorrow. And that, you know, the conversations that we have now and the inspiration that you all have brought to me in my life we'll make tomorrow better and we'll make our community of chefs, of people of color, of LGBTQ plus stronger because we have the power to do that. And so thank you so much. I wanted to make sure that I had a chance to say that you're all so inspiring. And I hope that, you know, we all are allies in life and we have the decisions. We, we can make that choice to stand united and to really make change for tomorrow so that our children don't have to say, I grew up in a food desert or a food junkyard. But to say that, you know, I remember my mom and Yusuf going and starting a garden and saying that the, there's great strength from the plants that we are going to grow. And it's not for us, it's for you and being able to have those conversations. So just know that, I, you know, I love the work that you guys are doing and thank you so much for, you know, including me in this day. I really needed it. And your beautiful faces have really 
it, it was it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, just to piggyback off of like community, yeah, I I fully agree. I think that like for us, it's super important to reinforce this idea of community. I mean, mm -hmm. even like what we say to our children is something we try to live out with the people around us in our spaces. Is like out there in the world, it's hard enough that like this should be a space that we create that's like joy and love and caring for each other and being able to take off the worldly mask that we wear mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. love on each other and laugh and joke and be able to talk in the vernacular and in the code and in the community that we all understand that we have to begin to code switch with when we go out into the world and our responsibility to doing that is through food. It's through how we we move in a food space, how we make products, how we cook food, how we tell a story through food that doesn't leave anyone in whatever space and walk that they're left behind. And, and it is it is a tall mantle, I think, like when people go like, what should I be doing? But it's just really simple and living out in, in a way that like, how would you feel welcome? Because those are very basic things. How do you feel like, oh, hey, I see you. Oh, hey, you're valued. Oh, hey, I appreciate you. It's those things that that keep the fight ignited. And so these, these are the spaces that we're super grateful for because we pour into it, but even we get something out of it. Like it was so great to hear Elton's prayer, even though that may not necessarily be my walk or view or the thing that my bloodline is connected to, I still have a very deep reverence for the fact that like, we believe in something and we can gather together in that thing that I can reverence your gift making room for you in such a beautiful way that you care enough for me even though we don't walk the same life to lay your beliefs on the line so that I can, can have the depth and breath to be myself in this space. And that's really the thing that like keeps us going and in spaces like this to be able to like inspire us all that like there, we're, we're all not a monolith and we're all so nuanced and you can be as particular as who you are and have your lived experience and we can come together and, and learn and grow and be inspired by one another. So it, it, this is just the, the ultimate equity. No. And we ate. No. I mean, those was was really good. Thank you very much, um, Cicely and MJ. Thank you very much again, Elena and Michael and Yusuf. I think Yusuf dropped off because I think he said he, he was doing lunch service. So he just stopped in for a quick minute. So Elena, thank you very much for grabbing him and help getting him to be part of this. Because I think he, he had a really important, uh, each of you had an important aspect to add to this. And I just want to be able to say thank you very much to, um, James Baird Foundation to Debbie for joining with me and putting up with me to put this together and to Colleen for um, having the patience and, and you know, the strength to put up with me. And as a matter of fact, and I wasn't pestering her a lot this time round. Okay, I was like, you know, let me just ease off a little bit. Um, so that's that's Colleen and and Debbie. But more importantly, uh, thank you guys very much for all that you did to make this um, this event a success um, with the food and the cooking. And as always, I look forward to trying um, MJ's and 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 Sicily's um, uh, chicken. Well, I don't eat chicken, but I'm gonna find a piece of lamb or a piece of goat or something. Okay. Don't, 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 I don't like that face, uh, Cicely. Uh, um, <laughs> you got it going on, okay. All also, right. I can't get no New Zealand salmon. But yeah, I'm gonna find a goat. Like I'm a not lamb. gonna get that salmon from last time. That was doing too much. But let me go on and find this goat real fast. Okay. Yeah, goat, goat's like $4.79 a pound. It's cheaper. Oh, that's anyway. real. Anyway, 
And <laughs> Elena, I am definitely interested in the um, blue corn and wild rice um, waffles. Interestingly enough, do you grind the wild, the wild rice before you mix it with the, the ground uh, blue corn and the wood ash? I'm just interested in that. But so thank you again very much. And let's get ready for our next um, presentation, which will be on December 1st for World AIDS Day. And we are talking about screening documentary, You Are Not Alone. And um, we're going to have some panelists, including a former porn star, a uh, transgender woman of color who is, who is a veteran. Um, Michael may be joining us for this as well. Um, so, and another transgender from Guyana um, may be joining us. So we are pulling this together as well for World AIDS Day. Um, so look out for us and we're continuing with a number of different events in the next several months as we go ahead. Um, and just as I, I think I have to say this, is that this event and all future events are being funded um, by, a, by a micro grant from New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So with that in mind, I'd like to say thank you. Anybody just want to say thank you and goodbye? Wave a pot in the air or something. I don't, no. don't throw any food at me, MJ. Do not <laughs> throw any food at me. Yes, because I'm a, I'm a come to this I'm a come to this camera right there. Thank then. you very much, Antoine. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, Colleen, thank you very much. Elena, if you're not thank gone, you. thank you again very much. Um, Michael, thank you. I'll be in touch with you. Um, I should send you my phone number so that you can so we can talk. But anyway, I'll send you an email or something. Um, yeah, I'll drop my um my appointment link in, in your private chat. I'm sorry. Yes, appointment link. In your private chat. Ooh, I just gone up. You're in like, <laughs> it's, it's it's COVID. That's how we do it. Ooh, I just got up in life. <laughs> right. Thank oh, you thank guys. You. Thank you guys very much. And um, <laughs> Debbie, 